Greetings, and welcome to the DC Bar for Bono Center's Nonprofit and Small Business Programs podcast series. On a monthly basis, we talk to experts on legal topics of note to nonprofit organizations as well as small businesses. I'm Daryl Maxwell, a managing attorney for the DC Bar Pro Bono Center. We have been lucky to have the co-sponsorship of our friends at the Center for Nonprofit Advancement, an organization that expands professional development opportunities, access, and capacity for nonprofit organizations throughout the Washington, DC region. This month, I'm happy to say, we're going to focus our attention on our for-profit businesses. We'll be discussing legal checkups, smart practices, for a healthy business. And I am pleased, very pleased, to welcome my friend and colleague, Siobhan Smith, to help us with all of this. Siobhan helps small and medium-sized businesses solve problems. She's the founder of the SJS Law Firm, where she represents business owners, entrepreneurs, and nonprofits in all aspects of their ventures, including employment matters, contracts, intellectual property compliance, and legal strategy. Siobhan is also a frequent volunteer of the DC Bar for Bono Center Small Business Brief Advice Legal Clinics. Before venturing out on her own, Siobhan worked in big law private practice. Siobhan is a graduate of Michigan State University, also the university of my older brother, and Howard University School of Law. Welcome, Siobhan. Hello. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I didn't realize that you had Spartan blood in your family. So yes, I do. Enough. Yes, I do. It also looks like my nephew, who is 17, is is making his way towards Michigan State as well. So we're okay. There. Well, they're making they're making good choices. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason I wanted you to join, other than I like you and you've been um, a great friend to our program, is that while there are, there are some there are some things and some some ideas that small businesses have and, and sort of knowledge that they understand about times where they might want to consult with a lawyer and times where they might understand they could potentially be in jeopardy. But there are also other times and other instances where they might let, let things slide. They may not really have a good understanding. And I wanted to sort of walk through um, what a legal checkup is and why mm -hmm. it might be of use. Um, you know, some of the things that I we were, we've we've talked about this before, but some of the things that I was thinking were probably more on uh, entrepreneurs' radar for when they might want to consult with a lawyer might be, you know, signing a lease or, you know, maybe they've got a trademark or a copyright issue, or if there's actual litigation involved, they might have an inkling that, hey, I might need to consult somebody on this. But there are so many other areas where business owners may let things slide and drop the ball on things. And so I wanted to ask you first, you know, what is this legal checkup and how can it be beneficial to business owners? Yes. So I developed this because I find that most people start businesses. And if you're in a place, especially like DC, where they make it very friendly and easy for businesses to start. So you can do a lot of this legwork on your own to start your business. You're obviously the expert at what you're doing. Um, so you're moving along and your business is generating revenue, um, but you may not have consulted an attorney and you may not have ever had a reason to. You may have felt like I don't have a reason to because you never had a problem at any time. Um, you know, you're a small operation. So you felt like, why well, I haven't needed to consult someone. Um, but undoubtedly, you know, the law is going to impact every aspect of your business. Um, so there will be times where, you know, there may not be anything horrible happening in your business, but you definitely want to take a moment and step back and assess. And it's almost like you go to the doctor and you don't go because there's anything wrong. You go because you want to make sure that everything's okay. Um, so it's almost taking that opportunity to say, you know what, everything is, is really smooth selling in my business, but I know that I have blind spots. You can't know everything. You can't do everything in your business. Um, so take it to an expert that can really kind of sit down with you and walk you through what you're doing, what your processes are, um, and help you kind of issue spot things you may not have been thinking about. That's gr that's really helpful. That's really helpful to know. And um, so oftentimes, and, and, and it's great that you mentioned that, um, you know, it's very easy. A lot of stuff can be done online. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, one of the things that you can do online is register your business, um, whether it be here in DC or, or all over the country. Um, most places you can go, you can register your business online. And, you know, once you've done that, they say, look, you're busy, you've been, you've incorporated, your business is fine. Um, and you can go on and transact business and get customers and clients, et cetera. However, I wonder, is that the end for a business owner? No, it is not the end. So <laughs> in, in most places, you know, even, you know, a, a, a limited liability company is a popular choice for lots of small businesses starting out. So you'll go down and you'll file that. But then there are a lot of other steps after that. A lot of people miss their business license. Um, and they may not realize there's a special endorsement that they need for their business. Um, they may miss registering with the proper tax authority um, in the city. And if you live in, you know, Maryland or Virginia, registering with your particular county, um, your tax authority. So I think that there are a lot of other small steps that people miss. But even if you've done all that right, a lot of times people forget that it's not a set it and forget it. Um, once you register with the state, they want to know that you're still in business. So there are yearly or bi-yearly filing requirements. So in DC, it's the year after you incorporate, then you have to file your annual report and it's every two years after that. Um, and it's essentially, you know, that you're still in the same place, you're still doing the same thing. Obviously the city wants their money as well. So there's a fee involved with it. Um, but if you don't do it, then it's your business can be revoked. So here you are thinking you're operating that you set up a business um, and you you have it, you know, you're operating and it's not, you know, legally in, in operation because you haven't gone through the process of, you know, making sure that you've kept that in check for your business. So I say, you know, once you incorporate, just set a tickler on your calendar so you know, and you'll usually get a notice in the mail as well. Um, but in case you miss that, so, because it's easy to forget so that it's something that stays on your radar. But even sure. if it's not an LLC, if you've created a corporation, um, a lot of businesses miss the other pieces as well, like making sure you issued all the, the sh shares that you're going to issue, that you've authorized the appropriate number of shares, that you have a ledger where it shows that you've done that, um, that you've issued shares or stock to whoever the owners are of the company, um, and just kind of having a file of all your corporate history for your company that you can come back to if someone has questions. No, that's really really helpful and important. One of the things I also wanted to mention was, particularly here in DC, if you miss your filing your biennial report and you miss your filing deadline, DC doesn't send you another notice. They send no, you one not. notice. They send you one notice, and then you may never hear from them again in terms of the uh, in terms of your business. This is not this is not like the IRS. You may send you a couple of notices. Um, or even um, local, you know, local government sort of tax registries or anything else, they will send you a notice once, and then you know, you if you miss it once, that's why your your advice about making sure there's something on your calendar that updates you as to whether you know to make sure that you've done it is really really helpful and important. Um, and right. I will also say, I will, let me also say for for um, this is not a particular small business or micro enterprise problem. Large businesses, really large businesses have gotten in trouble with this. Yes, absolutely. And it's one of those things that you're, you're really not looking for it until something comes up, like you're trying to get a loan or you're trying to get some sort of certification. So you're trying to make a move in your business and this minor thing can really hold you back. Right, right. So, and as a, as a, a point to move to our, our, our second piece of this, which is uh, in terms of uh, contracts and what you should be thinking about, another way that, that this comes up is that you may have contracted with a, with a different company, a larger company, maybe they decide that they're not going to, you know, they decide for some reason that they're not gonna pay you. You claim that, hey, you guys, you guys owe us $20,000, we had a contract, and then what they might, what a, what a, Another business might say is, well, you are properly registered as a business here in the District of Columbia. We see that your you know, registration is revoked. That means that you know, this contract is invalid. 
So that's another, you know, that's another corollary that folks need to make sure that everything's in place and you know, properly noted before, you know, contracting. Um, Absolutely. Right. Right. And so um, as we move towards contracts, you know, when we're thinking about them, you know, some folks who are fairly small may have one or two contracts or maybe still mm -hmm. sort of looking to, to try to get some. What are the types of things that entrepreneurs should be concerned about? Um, so the first thing I find happens more often than that is people don't have copies of their contracts. So they'll say, <laughs> we entered into this agreement, we've done something, but they have to contact the other party to get it or they don't have a record. So definitely keeping a master file of everything you find in your business um, is going to be crucial and key. So the first piece is just knowing what's out there. Um, so take an assessment of everything you find. Um, I would say the the biggest key is one, making sure you have them. Um, and sometimes people may neglect to get a contract because they think it's something small or they're just doing this one thing. Um, you really want to get as much in writing as possible, even if it is a friendly, familiar rela relationship. So that's one thing to think about. I think the second thing to think about is making sure you understand what you sign. You know, just because it's a contract doesn't mean it has to be something archaic that you don't understand that's in legalese. Um, it should be terms that are known to the parties, that the parties understand that, you know, even if a lawyer drafted it, that you fully understand what's in it. Because again, that happens more often than not, where a person signs something and they come back and say, well, I didn't know that that meant that. They told me it meant something different. I'm like, maybe they told you that, but here's what's in writing. Um, right. So making sure you know what's in writing and, and moving between drafts. Like it could be, we had a conversation about something, but that conversation never made it into writing. So then that, that doesn't count. <laughs> so making sure that everything <laughs> that you have discussed with that person actually ends up in the document, the final document, and you have an actual copy of that document. Sure. That's, I mean, the, yeah, the, the sort of the drafts. And also I was, I was going to also interject really quick that, um, and particularly because this happens to also be in the news, um, because you've agreed on something doesn't necessarily mean, and A, you want to make sure that you have your contract and you want to have mm -hmm. copies of it. You also want to make sure you have signed copies of your right. contract. Um, it's exactly. A, right. It's, it's important to establish, right, if, if there are differences between the certain drafts, you want to make sure that in the end you have, you've evidenced your contract and it's signed by you and the other party. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And, you know, there are legal theories that you can make an unsigned contract work if the parties have been performing or something, but you want to keep it clean and make it easy. So you want to make sure that everything is, is executed by the parties, that it's dated properly, um, and that, you know, people have started to perform after that date. So it's, again, keeping um, everything in, in order. Right, right. Yeah, so, so important. Um, and um, one more thing on contracts. Um, so are there agreements that are not contracts? Are there agreements that are not contracts? I hope I understand your question, but if, if, if you're referring to maybe like an oral agreement. Uh-huh. So there are times when an oral agreement can be an agreement, but there are a lot of limitations on that. So I can't obviously agree to sell you my house verbally and then that work because it, it's a land contract so it has to be in writing or mm -hmm. if it can't be performed in, in a certain amount of time if there's a certain amount you know if it's a good over a certain amount then that can't be an oral contract but there are instances where if you have you know all the elements of a contract and you have verbally agreed to do something then that can be a contract however you know an oral contract is worth the paper that it's written on um, <laughs> so you really want to strive to get as much in writing as possible, but you can bind yourself orally um, in some instances. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure we both get a lot of uh, clients who have, you know, have a, have believe they've agreed to things and believe they have an agreement from somebody else. And the more of that you can have in writing, is the better. As, right. As a, I mean, it's, 
it's just like um back to the 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 contract piece to getting everything in writing. It'll be you know we had this document, but they told me X Y Z or we agreed to this or they told me this meant that. Um, none of that means anything. What means something is what's in writing, especially if there's um, some sort of integration clause in the contract that says that it's only the things that are in this document that mm-hmm. mean something. Um, and again, people get in business. You want you want to believe people. Most people, you know, have good hearts and they want to do the right thing. Um, but it's just best practices to treat your business like a business um, and, to, and to be formal when possible. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so as folks are out there trying to, to get clients and, and you know, amass more contracts that they can eventually hopefully sign, um, one of the things that I think, um, one, at least one of the places where people I think are getting into at least some potential trouble um, is in the sort of the social media and advertising space. I wonder if you could mm-hmm. talk a little bit about um, about that and how you know how how businesses can protect themselves. Absolutely, I think because this is one of those areas that is constantly evolving. We see you know the issues coming up with Facebook. That it's one of those areas where you definitely want to have a checkup to make sure you have everything right. Um, because again, it could be an area where you haven't had any any problems, but you don't want to have any. So I think, you know, if you have a website, making sure you have the proper privacy policies, terms and conditions. And what happens more often than not is you people will just copy something from another website, like, oh, this business is like my business. I'll just copy their policy and use that. That's a bad idea. You want to make sure you have something that is really tailored to your business and, and what you're doing. And especially if you're collecting data, if you if people can come to your website and put their information in, if you are collecting credit card information because you're selling a good online, um, you want to make sure that all your policies are up to date on how you're using the information from people who come to your page. So that, that's one aspect of it. And then on the, again, the social media aspect of it, Um, We were thinking about advertising. Again, it's an area that changes so much. Um, If you're using social media, if you have your employees using your social media for you, making sure that they kind of have clear direction on what they can say, what they can't say, um, what the policies are. So, again, because social media, data, websites, areas that change so much, want to make sure that you're sitting down with someone uh, and knowing what you need to have. Sure. No, that's so very true and you know as we as we've seen um, social media develop there are always unfortunate missteps in in yeah. tweets that are sent out in emails that are sent to the wrong group or in just in terrible things that are said by you know so you know and and usually the 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 issue is that you know particularly for big companies they'll say oh well this was you know, this was uh, an intern who was here for the summer who mm-hmm. had control of, of this account. And I know for for smaller entrepreneurs, usually that might be, you know, that that might be invested in the principal business owner. It might be invested in mm-hmm. in somebody who, you know, they may have outsourced that kind of work as well. So you want to make sure that you know who has the keys to your Twitter account or to mm-hmm. your email traffic. Well, and um, you, who has the keys, making sure that they know what they can and cannot say, that you are giving them policies, but also that what will happen is if you are a smaller company, you may have someone set up your social media for you, and then they leave, and then they take it with them. Like, you don't have the password, right. you have no access to right. it. Um, right. So making sure that you have the power to monitor your own social media to make changes if you need to, to remove a person from speaking from you if you need to be able to do that. That's that's such an excellent point because we have had clients who, you know, exactly the situation, somebody walked away and all of a sudden their website reappeared elsewhere with with pretty much the exact same data and a couple different changes. Pages were exactly the same, ripped off from the, from the, uh, the other firm's website. So, Right, making sure that you, there are practices in place to take care of that is so extremely important. Um, right. And so, and also, so as we, you know, one of the things as we're talking about folks having the keys to your social media, 
how you sort of operate with the folks that work for your business is really, really crucial. But also how they are classified is mm -hmm. just as important. Um, I get this question at our clinic all of the time. So can I just have everybody that works for me be an independent contractor or in, you know, or in parlance like a 1099 employee or worker? And mm -hmm. people just assume <laughs> they can do that. I, I'm just going to ask you fairly broadly, can they do that? So I, I equally get this question a lot and from a, in a lot of different contexts it comes up and it, it makes sense. It is very expensive to have employees. Um, there are wage and hour laws, there are um, leave laws, there are taxes. And so if you're starting out, you're trying to find ways to outsource and grow your business without the kind of capital um, expenditure that an employee is. So obviously an independent contractor makes a whole lot of sense. And a lot of people are interested in, in the arrangement because, you know, you don't take taxes out. They have maybe a little more flexibility. So it seems to work on both ends. However, just because you say someone is an independent contractor does not mean they're an independent contractor. Um, if, just because you have a, an agreement for them to be an independent contractor, it does not mean that they're an independent contractor. There are lots of, you know, if the IRS cares about who's an employee, the Department of Labor cares about who's an employee. Um, in D.C., the Department of Employment Services cares. So there are a lot of agencies that are looking over your shoulder to make sure that the people that you say are contractors are really contractors. Um, and so what I usually do with, with clients is I'll just take them through the, the checklist. Of, well, let's talk about what this person is actually doing in your business. How important are they to your business? How much control do you have over them? Do they do the same thing for other people or only for you? Um, are they bringing their own tools to the job for you? Um, then you can start to assess, is this really a contractor or not? And and, uh, and what will happen is you'll go through the assessment and maybe someone will say, I'll take the risk. Fine, but then the penalty for that can be a lot. Um, because, <laughs> right. it's, you know, back everyone wants their money back, then some. And, and penalties on top of that, um, especially if it was kind of a willful violation. So I always say, you know, if you, and it, it could be great sometimes, you know, I always say if you have a person who, you know, they only work for you, they show up to you nine to five, they do all your administrative work, um, they work at a desk you gave them, at a computer you gave them, doing all the things you told them to do, it's going to be really hard to say that this person is a contractor. On the other hand, and, and it could get, you know, gray, you know, they work for you 30 hours a week, they have some flexibility, um, sometimes they work from home. So it, it can get gray sometimes, but you want to make sure you're sitting down and really assessing what the person is doing for your business. Yeah, I, I can't I, I can't say enough how often um, there are difficulties with this particular subject, and it's it's small employers, it's huge employers that, you know, there have been, mm -hmm. there's been mounds of litigation about this because the, the test to sort of determine an employee versus independent contractor are fairly complex. And so mm -hmm. if you're having the, if you're, you know, if you're a business and you're, and you're confused, you're having this issue, you certainly need to talk to somebody about it. It's, it's not worth it to not have this sorted out correctly because of all the penalties that Siobhan just talked about. Right. It's not the kind of thing you want to wing it. You want to sit down and talk to someone who's been been through it, help other businesses classify and go through it, um, and and make the right decision for your, your business. Because, again, you don't want something that you could have done right the first time to really derail you when you're getting yourself primed for, for bigger things and for bigger growth. Right. So in our last like minute or two, I just wanted to ask Siobhan, do you have any parting thoughts for our small business owners? I do. Um, a couple of things. I think, you know, starting a business is, is a daunting task. And there are a lot of, you know, bankers, accountants, lawyers, like all these people who are like, well, what do I need? What do I really need for my business? Um, so I think it's worth it to have a team. You want to talk to all those people, but you might not need them all the time. Um, so sit down with an accountant and figure out, how do I work you into my business in an affordable way? Talk to a banker ahead of time about the kind of things you need to do to get yourself um, attractive for loans if you need it. 
talk to an attorney in the beginning um, because there could be affordable ways for you to work with an attorney to figure out what's really necessary for your business um, and, and a timeline for getting those things done or a budget for getting those things done, working with, you know, your various state small business um, centers to give you support. So I say it's kind of incorporating as many people into your your tribe as, as possible so that you aren't blindsided with things happen happen to you. Because it could be, again, you're floating along and nothing's happening in your business, but you want to make sure that things stay well. So that's why, you know, I came up with this legal checkup as an opportunity to engage small businesses who are starting out. They felt like they haven't really needed to engage an attorney a lot, but want to make sure that they're doing everything right. So I say, you know, it's it's not to be in a silo, engage people before you think you need them just to find out what you need. So those would be some of my, my parting thoughts. And then definitely coming to the Small Business Brief Advice Legal Clinic, which has been my pleasure to meet you there and volunteer there, which is an opportunity for small businesses in the city to come and get great advice from a lot of de dedicated volunteers to help you work through some of these issues and help you issue spot where you may not see where the issues are. Well, thank you for that plug since I didn't have, so I didn't have to do it. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so let me again say thank you, Siobhan, so much for all of this fantastic information and for your insights. Um, for more information or to access all of our other podcasts, webinars, and other helpful information, please visit our website at www.lawhelp.org slash DC slash CED. Thanks again, Siobhan, and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you again.